So this morning we're starting off a new sermon series entitled Making Room for That Something More. We're sort of unpacking Easter and all the amazingness that Jesus won for us on the cross, the victory over sin, death, and the devil, just the strength that he gives us, the forgiveness, the peace, the freedom, all that kind of stuff. Today we're going to start with the hardest one that I could ever, or Jesus could ever ask a disciple of him to follow. The hardest one, and that's faith. Now we're thinking, what in the world is faith that makes it so hard? So how would you define faith as, you were, as you're just thinking about this and kind of think about it in your mind? One of the, the most helpful descriptions of faith that I think resonates with our modern world today is when I say faith, I mean trust. When I have faith in Jesus, it means I trust Jesus with my life. When I have faith in God, it means I trust God with my life. Faith equals trust. That, that's all it means. And so just out of curiosity, how many of you guys are amazing at trusting just amazing at trust. Oh, wait. How many of you guys are amazing at doubt? That's why this is the hardest one. There's so few people that we actually trust in this world. I mean, we could probably name them all on one hand. The people that we just don't even think twice about. We just trust them when they say something. But man, everybody else, there's doubts. I mean, are they going to do what they say they're going to do? Are they going to show up? Are they going to be there? Are they really the person that they're portraying? Are they not the person they're portraying? Are they really going to do? I mean, we have all these doubts as we go through life. In fact, it's so interesting. I, several years ago, I did this sermon entitled, what did I call it? Stop Defeating Yourself. Because I honestly believe that so often in life, because of our negative outlook toward people, because of our negative outlook toward life, we sort of set ourselves up as victims as we go through life. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. We expect negative, and what happens? Negative happens. And that reinforces that negative view of life. And, and pretty soon, man... We're cynical. I mean, that's one of the, uh, actually the, oh, what, what am I trying? One of the things that they talk about Gen Xers being very cynical, but we become cynical as we go through life. We become non-trusting as we go through life. We, we struggle to find the positive. So whenever something happens that's beyond our control just a little bit, we're sure that it's going to go in a negative direction. And as we set ourselves up in that life, we become kind of victims to our self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, there's so many people that I would just entitle negative Nancys today, right? Or negative Neils today, or however you want to say it, that whenever something new happens, it's hard. We go to the doctor and he says that we have cancer. Instead of saying, okay, God, how are you going to fix this? We go, all is lost. You know, we lose our job and we look at our finances. Instead of looking to God, we look to ourselves and we say, all is lost. We look to, to, when we think about national elections or the politics of our day, we, we think all is lost even before the elections. And then we, what do we do? We, we build and we hope in that one person that might be elected new that's going to change everything. And they're elected and nothing seems to change. We don't look to God, we look to people. And so often we reinforce this negative view over and over and over. But this reality is what Jesus was talking against in Matthew 9, 29. In this verse, Jesus is actually healing somebody, right? And he shares with them, in the midst of all the negative Nancys that I'm sure were around in that day, all the doubt in this guy's own heart, he says this to him. He says, according to your faith or your trust in me, will it be done unto you? In other words, he's saying, you, buddy, get to decide how much I work in your life, how much God blesses you in your life. You get to decide, not these negative Nancys, not your family, not anybody else, but you. You get to choose how much you experience of me in your life. You get to choose the limits and set, that you set upon yourself. Because God says this incredible things. He says, according to your faith, your trust in him, will it be done unto you? So the key question I want to look at this morning is this, what are you expecting then? If God can do anything and that's your God, if God loves you beyond anything that you can imagine, wants what's best for you as you're going through life, not, now what's best for you is getting you to heaven, not always fulfilling your, your hopes and dreams and those kind of things. I, otherwise, we'd have all won the lottery, right? Wasn't it wasn't really like 1.3 billion. I was really hoping. Anyway, but he's always doing what's best for us, right? And so as he walks us through this life, he's this amazing heavenly father that's continually to be with us. He, he walks with us every step of the way. We're never alone. He strengthens us. He gives us the next ability to take that next step. He's, he's always there. He frees us from our past. He, he gives us peace in the moment. He gives us strength to keep on fighting the battles. If that's our God, then nothing, nothing is impossible. God says again, according to your faith will be done unto you cool part is we just had Easter last week, so we should be all like, you know, geared up, right, to go share Jesus with the world. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. We're all excited about that. We're forgiven. We're renewed. We're saved. We're going to be in heaven one day because of him. 
according to your faith, it will be done unto you. So to talk about this, this, this really hard thing of faith and putting our trust in Jesus. And I, let me just start by saying this. It just takes a little trust in a big God to be saved. And fortunately, we don't have to have 100% trust because, man, we would all stink at that. But God takes that little bit of faith that we have in Jesus, and he forgives, and he renews, and he strengthens, and then he tries, tries to grow that amount of faith in us as we go through life. That's the, the mercy of our amazing God. But to talk about this today, I want to talk about David, especially when he was younger, when, when he was a high schooler. I'm going to talk about the David and Goliath event. And in this story, we have Goliath, and he was a giant of a man from the enemy nation of the Philistines. He was over nine feet tall and wore a couple hundred pounds of silver and metal. He was sort of the rock, you know, of Palestine, except, you know, much bigger and broader. And Israel was flat out afraid of him. That's what scripture says. He had single-handedly immobilized the Israelite armies, and it seemed like to a man they were terrified to go up against him. In staff meeting, we were talking about the Nephilim, and those are the giants of the old, or giants of mankind, giants of men, and and so Seth was asking, you know, are they 100 feet tall? I mean, how big are these giants? And I said, well, I had a neighbor who used to be a, an offensive lineman for the University of Texas. He was pretty much a giant to me. I mean, he was like, I don't know, six foot eight, and he's like this big still. And I was like, wow. I used to play football, pick a football at the SC with some of the offensive linemen. And I felt like when I was running through there, I was running between trees. And those guys seemed like, like giants to me. I, I knew a, a, a tight end that, that went to SC that um, he played in the NFL for quite a few years. And he was, again, like six, eight, just huge, huge man. If you've ever sat on the sidelines of an NFL football game, or if you've ever sat on the sidelines of an NBA basketball game, these guys are just huge huge people. Now, I just think of my neighbor, Robbie, you know, he was really big, really wide. And if we were going to have a, a fight of any sort, you know, that I had to get close to him, I would be terrified. God says, go fight this man. You can have victory. No, no, I'm going to really get hurt. He could just snap me in two. I mean, he's so big. Go fight this man. I'll be with you. It would take a lot, wouldn't it? To put myself at 54 years old or even 24 years old with Robbie, right? Just any bit to go against him in any sort of way, it would be terrifying. If you get a sense of that, you get a sense of the Israelite army looking at Goliath. And, and you know, one of the things, I sat next to a, a former NFL player on a plane one time, a former offensive lineman, but he was back in the, the 60s and 70s and stuff like that where they were just shaped different. And we were talking about football and he said the difference today is now you got 300 and something pound guys that are, have 4% body fat and run a 4-4. You know, it's just, when they hit you, they hit you like a Mack truck. It's just different today. Everybody in the world, it seemed, in Israel was frightened. And every day this guy would come out, just imagine the arrogance here, right? And he would walk out to the battlefield and he would shout to the army of Israel, send out your best man and I'll fight him and whoever wins, wins the battle. Everybody was frightened to death, the Bible says. But on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and the Israelites were dismayed and they were terrified. Now, you could apply any sorts of things to this. You could apply that doctor's visits where you find out you have something and all of a sudden it changes your life and you're terrified of what the future holds. Lose your job and you're terrified of how you're going to supply and, and, and take care of your family. You got a relationship that feels like it's, it's, it, it's, you're losing it. And it, whether it be a spouse or a kid, you're just terrified of what the future might hold. There's a lot of things in this life that fill us with terror as we look at the events that are right before us and the things that we can control. Then along comes this little teenage kid, right? Imagine 16, 17 years old, thin, just skinny as all be. He had been out tending sheep in the back 40. His name was David. And he starts talking to his brothers and people around. He says, I'm not afraid of this guy. And all of a sudden, that word makes it to the king, and he finds himself in front of the king. And he says, you know, I'm not afraid, king. I'll go fight this guy. God's already helped me fight lions and bears and given them over to me. He had this incredible level of expectations. And to be honest, if I had defeated a lion or bear, I'd probably feel a little bit more, you know, uh, confident about going into a battle. But David just was the utmost of confident. He goes before the king and says, I have no worries, zero worries about defeating this guy. God will be with me. And so he says in verse 32, David says to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, for your servant will go and fight. In other words, he says, I'll do it. I've got the slingshot and everything, so I'm going to be okay. I mean, that's how I beat the lions and the bears, right? And so in verse 37, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. While everybody else was saying, that guy's too big, we'll never be able to kill him. David was saying, that guy's so big, I'll never be able to miss him. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be that easy, right? What was the difference? Perspective. 
One, he's too big to kill. The other, he's too big to miss. That's the difference God gives us as we trust him in this life. And that's the hard thing, trust. But when we trust God, he is one that is always faithful to us, always there for us, always rooting for us, always behind the scenes with us, working, always there to strengthen us, to give us peace, to get us through the situation, to get us to the other side. He gives us a peace, a confidence that's otherworldly, it seems. As we go through this story of David, though, God shows us three things that expecting the best from God does. Placing our faith in him more and more, trusting him for the more, what that does in our life. And and one of the first things that it does, just on kind of the surface thing, is is it glorifies God. It's actually a, a form of worship. It honors God. And that's the first reason we ought to increase our level of expectation, to make more room in our lives for faith. Because first and foremost, it honors God. In verse 46, David says this to Goliath. Again, standing before a nine-footer, imagine the biggest guy that you know and you're ready to go to battle. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head today. I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. I guess this is biblical trash talk, right? He's just telling them what's going to happen. But he's based on some confidence here. He's picturing for Goliath what's going to happen. He's planting a negative seed in his mind. He's visualizing it for him. And what do you think it does to Goliath? makes him mad. He's already mad. This little tiny teenager's coming out to fight him. Are you kidding me? Is this the best you got? This is a joke. This is an insult to who I am. Why don't you send out your best warrior? And then this kid's got a mouth on him, and he's telling him all this stuff, and he's just getting more and more frustrated. David continues, the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. And those who gather here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into his hands. Who's he giving credit to? God. God's going to do this. It doesn't matter what you got. You go to the doctor. God's got it. You go, you go to look at your finances. God's got it. You go look at your relationships. God's got it. You look at all these different areas of your life that are filling you with fear. God's still there. He still loves you. I mean, what a what a testimony of faith that's so different than most of the people around us. This teenage kid is saying this whole thing to this massive man all before it's going to happen. But as a way to totally undersell it here, he knew God was going to show up. Isn't that a different kind of confidence than we approach most of life with? He knew that God was going to show up. In fact, nothing pleases God more than our great expectations of him. It pleases God when you expect a lot from him because you're saying in your prayers, he could do anything. I know he loves me and he will do anything unless he has some better plan. He's going to accomplish this purpose in our midst right now. When my kids were little especially, but but even today when my kids come expecting of me, you know, it raises my responsibility for sure, but it also raises my pride, right? Like, my kids come to me, I need some more money for gas. Why didn't you have a better summer job, I say, but no. But it raises my, I mean, my kids think I can do anything at this point. It's almost mystical to me, right? Like, but they can, oh, they can come to dad and I'll give him some money for gas. It's going to come out of my pocket one way or the other, so I give it to him, you know, money for gas. Because they still believe that God, or that dad can answer all these things. I want you to think back to when you were a kid. You had a problem and you ran to mom or dad and you say, mom, dad, could you solve this problem? And you just knew somehow, some way that they would figure it out. As we grow older, we see that that's not always the case for sure, but my, not when we're a kid. I want you to take that simple kid faith and, and the way that you looked at your parents and know that when you put your faith in God, he comes through 100% of the time. He's always faithful to his promises. He's always there for you. My God can do anything that is pleasing and honoring to God. That's why the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please him. Who is your God? I mean, that's the, kind of the, one of the roots behind our, our, so much of our doubt. Who do we believe God is? I think so often we put Jesus in this little box. I trust you to save me. I trust you to forgive me. And so most of the time, we trust that our sins are forgiven. And most of the time, we trust if we got, we'd go to heaven. When does that get stressed? Oh, when we did that one thing that was so horrible, we've already asked God for forgiveness five or six times. We don't know if he could ever forgive us because that, who could do such a horrible thing like we just did? And we're just beating ourselves up and we forget that when we said, I'm sorry, the first time he hurt us and he forgave us, or when we're on a deathbed and we're thinking about all the horrible things that we've done in life and we're wondering, can God still forgive me? But most of the time, most of the time, we trust that implicitly. But that's where we draw the box. And we get a health scare, financial scare, relational scare, you name the scare, and that's outside the box. And we start wondering, what in the world is God going to do here? 
Can I trust him with this? Can I bring this to him? Is he going to hear me? Is he going to answer? What in the world do I do with all this stuff outside the box? And, and that's where we doubt him, and that's when we get afraid. Expecting the best also increases our ability. Every athlete knew, knows that attitude is the winning edge. In fact, they've done studies, and, and, they, and they've shown that a- athletes that expect to, do, to win perform far better than those that expect to lose. Muhammad Ali He was a great fighter back in the day, only lost two fights before his first retirement. And both fights had something kind of interesting that was in common. Before each one of those fights, he gave a press conference prior, and he said these words. And the only time he ever said these words were these two times. He said, if I should lose this fight, and then he went on and lost. He set himself up to lose. Those are the only two times he lost prior to his first retirement. If I should lose this fight... When we act in faith or in trust, we receive an additional strength. Look at David compared to Muhammad Ali before those two fights. There's a supernatural power that's made available to us, a different kind of confidence and assurance. In verse 48, as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David actually ran. He said it ran quickly to the battle line to meet him. Reaching into the bag, he taking out a stone, he slung it in his slingshot and struck the Philistine on his forehead. I don't know if you guys know this, but that was about the only part of Goliath that wasn't covered with metal. So often it was just right here. It was the only part that was open. They had metal on the sides. They had metal all over the body. And David, without any hesitation, runs to the line, slings up, I don't know how to do a slingshot, but slings up the stone, right? Shoots it and nails him right there, trusting that God would be there, that he would show up. I don't know what his plan was if he missed, right? Goliath was coming at him too, but he didn't even think about that. He was setting himself up in his faith in God that said he will provide. In other words, don't ever use the lack of ability as an excuse. I'm too young, I'm too old, I don't have the ability, I don't have the education, I don't have this, I don't have that, because God can always compensate for those things that are missing in our life. If you have a level of expectation that he loves you, that he cares, that he's there, that he'll show up when you need him. Today's impossibilities are tomorrow's miracles. So often I think like that, even in church, this sometimes this happens, you know, you'll come up and, and, and we'll be doing a capital campaign and you say, how much is that going to cost? That's insane. How could it cost that much? But inflation is shut things up. And in fact, if you were at the congregational meeting and, or on the building committee, you know that we're going to be looking at a capital campaign in the fall. And, and one of the harsh realities for us is, man, you can't build what we showed at the congregational meeting in one swoop anymore, at least not unless God changes the dynamic of our giving. And so we're looking at a, a three campaigner, right? Three, three-year campaigns to build this building. And the first one's parking, which, let's face it, that's a lot more sexy than a water line, but still not in the sexy round, right? And so you're looking at that, and you can get discouraged, and you think, oh, man, how are we ever going to be able to build? Or you can look at 31st Street. You can look at how he provided for us as we went through COVID. You can look at all the the different funds he gave us to fix uh, fix an electrical system that was going uh, going out, to fix a a water line situation that was keeping us from doing things, about how he helped us renovate most of the site. And this site has never, at least in my time, looked better than it does at this point. I mean, we still got the portables, and and they are a miracle unto themselves, right? But, But the reality is God continues to do amazing things And he's done miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle during this COVID time. And yet we look at this new thing and all of a sudden we forget all the ways he's provided and we think, oh, he's never going to do it. So let me just reframe this a little bit. Let's plan on three, but let's give him our prayers and let's give him the opportunity to respond and to do something extraordinary to make it a two campaign or a one campaign thing. Let's not take him out of the process, but let's put him back into the process to see what he might do. Again, because today's impossibilities are tomorrow's miracles. And what's crazy is we've seen that happen. God increases our ability when we expect him to work in our lives. He just does. In fact, Satan's favorite words to us are these. You can't do it. Ever thought those words? Ever said those words? He wants to put doubts in your mind. But faith works in the realm of the impossible and the things that you cannot control. David, man, he's extraordinary. But he didn't make any excuses he expected God to work. Let me give you one more. 
Expecting the best encourages other people. Optimism, enthusiasm, and faith, they're all encouraging. They're contagious. In verse 51, it says, David ran and he stood over Goliath after he had killed him. Now, I want you to know, Goliath's sword was huge. I mean, this was a nine-footer. He had a huge sword. So David, just this kid, he's taking the sword like this, and he's going like this, trying to get it over, and goes like that. It wasn't like one stroke, like he was somehow an impressive kid. It was like a laborsome kind of exercise that God gave him the strength to pick up that sword and to kill Goliath. He, told, he took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from the scabbard. And after he had killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. This little tiny kid who could barely, barely pick up the sword kills Goliath. And they all saw it as a sign. This was impossible, what we just watched. God is on their side, they said. And they bolted. Look at the attitude change then in the Israelite army. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward and, and with a shout pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron, their cities. Everybody wanted to be in on the winning team. Everybody. All of a sudden, they got their confidence back. All of a sudden, they were motivated. All of a sudden, they were inspired by what David had done and what God had done. They were encouraged by the, David, by the faith and the work of God. Expecting the best is a powerful step of faith. It is. And it takes our fear and our worry and our stress and it turns it into confidence and peace and strength. But how can we start applying this stuff to our lives? How can we become better trusters when it comes to God? I'll give you a first one. One of the first things we should probably do is watch our words because they're telling of what's going inside of us. In Ephesians 4.29, it says, Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth, but only that which is helpful for the building up of others, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This really is supposed to be the outtake of all the stuff that we say, is that it should be for the benefit of those that we're talking to. He says, words are a powerful force in our lives, and they give a tremendous influence. And if you're ever going to live by faith, you've got to learn to watch the way that you talk. In fact, let me give you three phrases that you probably should just start erasing from your vocabulary. One of the first ones is something like, what if? Right? What if is a statement of doubt? It's not a statement of faith. One time a man came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, Jesus, if you can help me, right? If you can heal me, if you can do this. And Jesus looked straight at him and said, what do you mean if? Right? Jesus didn't have any ifs in his vocabulary, right? At least not when it came to doubt. There were no ifs in faith. How about another one? I can't. Truth is, there's a big difference between I can't and I won't. There's a big difference between I can't and I don't want to. There's a big difference between I can't and it's not a priority or I can't and it's not God's will. But to just say I can't is a contradiction to Scripture, a contradiction to our faith, a contradiction to Philippians 4.13 where it says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A comedian one time said, we're Americans, not Americans, right? But there's something to that, right? How about another one? Yes, but. What people are saying when they say yes, but, is that they don't really want to change. They don't really want to grow. They don't really want any help. What do they want? They want you to feel bad for them. Yeah, I would do this, but. Oh, I would, yeah, but. They just want pity. God calls us to start eliminating these kind of things from our vocabulary because it's, it's sentiments of stuff going on in our heart. And there's a second thing, too, that we can use to apply, and it's this. When we pray, I want you to start thanking God in advance. There's a dynamic principle that's taught in this verse and all the way through scriptures, but that we must expect an answer when we're praying or we shouldn't pray. I mean, just objectively, we get this, right? We're going to God and saying, God, will you do this? And we're trusting that he'll do it for us. Why in the world would we go to God if we don't trust that he'll do it? It's an insult to who God is. God says, I'm able to do anything, right? There's nothing that's beyond me. I love you, so I'm only going to do things that are good for you, right? But I care about you. There's nothing that I won't or can't do. Why are you putting doubt in the midst of us? Why are you sabotaging your prayers before they even get going? Again, there's a principle here that says this, that you've got to believe that it's already here before I got it, right? If you believe after you get it, it's not really called faith anymore. It's called gratitude. But how many of us in our prayer lives would really or actually do live in that area of gratitude? We pray something, then if God gives it to us, we're like, you're amazing, you're awesome, I love you, you know, you're the one, I, I knew you'd do it kind of thing. But how many of us can stay there in the in-betweens? and keep on regularly praying. 
God, get a hold of my kid and bring him back to you. I want to see him in heaven one day. God, help me restore this relationship with my kid that's broken. Help me restore this relationship with my spouse. That I'm so afraid she's just going to walk out the door. God, help me with my finances. I mean, things have got out of control with this, with this inflation, and I'm on a fixed income, right? I have a 401, and I'm retired, and I don't know where else to find the money. I'm so worried about what the future holds. God, help me when, with my health. I just found out I have cancer, and I don't know what to do. God, be there. Hear me. Can you pray that again and again and again and again, trusting that he hears that he's there, that he cares, that he loves you, and that he will answer. Can you get to that place where you can be like David? And can you imagine anything with, like, if you could approach it the way David did? I know he's going to fix this. I just got to figure out how, right? I know he's going to fix this. I just got to be patient. I know he's going to be on the other side. He's going to help me through. He's going to do whatever. I know that. So I'm going to go forward with complete confidence, knowing that that is the end product. Mark eleven twenty two. Jesus says, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says, it will happen. Then it will be done for him, just as he said. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So let me ask you again, what are you expecting from God? We established at the beginning that we're great doubters, not so great at trusting, but what will you trust God for? I keep telling you to trust him for the more in your life. Trust him that he's got it. You'll experience peace. Trust him that you're forgiven. You'll experience freedom. Trust him that he's there and you'll experience strength. Expect the best. Expect God to take it and to work it all out. Again, he says, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. Nothing is more pleasing to God than your great expectations. Now, I give a sermon like this, and one of the, the outtakes or one of the responses is always this. Pastor, you don't get it. I mean, it's hard to trust God when it's really important to you. It's hard to trust God when the answer means almost everything. And so I'll just share this from you. God is faithful. If he has promised to answer something in his word, he is 100% faithful in answering that from his word every single time. He's never failed because he always comes through on his promises. And I'll give you one more. I'm an eyewitness to this fact. I've lived 54 years. And 100% of the time where God has promised things and promised to do things, he has done so in my life in spades over and over and over. There's nothing that you have to doubt here. When he says you're forgiven, you don't have to worry about that forgiveness. You know that you're forgiven. When he says that he's there, you don't ever have to worry that he's someplace else having lunch. When he says, I will strengthen you, I'll be with you, I'll give you hope, courage, peace, all those different things, you can count on him for it 100% of the time time. He's faithful. And even in those areas that are outside of his promises, stuff like 31st Street, how in the world are we ever going to build on this site? Stuff like healing my daughter when she was in kindergarten from a brain tumor. Stuff like Mike adopting three beautiful kids and then God opening up Krista's womb so she could have three more. I mean, stuff like this next building campaign, stuff like the, the, the administration facility that we couldn't build with, with, without doing 31st Street. I mean, all these different things that God has done over and over and over. Here, here's what I want you to know. God is the perfect dad. You may not have a, a good dad, but, but God is the perfect dad, and he loves you, and he wants everything for you, but most of all, he wants to spend eternity with you in heaven. And so he's going to do things that allow you to get there He's going to say yes to things, no to things, and wait to things. And when he says yes, we're all good with that. That's the gratitude part. You're awesome, and most of the time he works in that realm. But just like a good dad, there's times that he says wait. And there's times that he says no. But here's his promise, and I want you to hear this. When he says wait or no, it's always, let me emphasize it, always because he has something better in store. We pray, please save this person from death. Please don't take them right now. Please, I want more time with them and God takes them home. Is it, was, was it for something better? Yeah. See, that person just received their reward. And who knows that God saved them or spared them from, from losing their faith somehow along the line and made sure that they would be with him forever and eternity. We just don't know all the information, but God does. He's always working with all the facts. Wouldn't you like to know all the facts with politics? It would help you kind of weed through all the misinformation or whatever it is. You just know what's right or know what's wrong. God does. He knows everything. And he's always working for our good. And so when he says no, he says, I got you and I love you. And I know you're frustrated with this no. And I'll be there for you as you work your way through it. But I want you to know it's because this is coming down the line. 
and this is what you need, and this is what's important, and this is what's better for you than this thing right here. And we can wish it was different all the time. I can't tell you how many people want God to be a vending machine God, where you put in the prayer, put in the quarter prayer, right? And all of a sudden you get what you want. But that would be catastrophic for our lives. I'd much rather have a father that's invested in me, that cares about me, that's there for me, that wants to spend eternity with me, that knows what's best for me, that has all the information that is making those decisions and not me. But it gives us a different kind of confidence and a different kind of peace than to pray, doesn't it? Because we know he's either going to answer yes, which again, he does most of the time. I don't know why we don't pray about everything. And the second thing is if it's a no or a wait, we still know it's the best outcome possible. It changes everything in the way that we look at prayer. What we have to do and what I want to challenge you to do today is to stop sabotaging his answers with our doubt with our lack of trust. As evidence, it's why we worry and stress and have fear, why we have anxiety as we go through life. Those are all evidences that we're not trusting him. And instead, to begin this process of making more room for faith, more room for trusting him with the more, more room for applying who it is that we know we believe in and allowing him to do something extraordinary. Guys, God loves you so much. Go with this encouragement today and serve him always with joy. Amen? Let me pray. God, we love you. And we talk about faith today, and we think that that would be such an easy thing. You know, by, by grace, we are saved through faith, and it's that faith that makes sure we go to heaven. And yet, what we just established in most of this conversation, Lord, is that we're really good at doubting, and it terrifies us to trust you. Father, help us overcome that fear. Help us trust that you've got us no matter what, that you're with us no matter what, that you'll get us through no matter what. Help us know that you're always working for our good and your glory. Help us remind us that you are for us and not against us. Remind us that you're our perfect dad that's always doing what's in our best interests. But so often we just act like the kids, though. We complain and we moan when we don't get our way. We get terrified because we can't see around the corner. We... We lose our trust in you pretty quickly, Lord. And I guess that's why it's one of the hardest things. And so I I pray today that you would send your spirit upon us powerfully today and that you'd help us one area after another area trust you for the more so that we can anew experience that peace and that strength and that hope and that freedom that you have for us, that we can experience what David did as he was going against Goliath, knowing that you'll show up. And that's our prayer today. We pray in the name of Jesus and all God's people said.